Good afternoon, everybody. Good morning in Europe. And for the few courageous people that join us from the US, good night. Uh, my name is Bert Hoffman. I'm the director of the East Asian Institute at NUS. And I'm delighted to welcome you to the East Asia Distinguished uh, Public Lecture on Zoom today on the theme of the world after coronavirus. The coronavirus obviously has affected millions of people around the world. Uh, almost 4 million people died. Uh, more than 180 million people were directly affected and hundreds of million people more indirectly affected. It gave a major blow to the world economy. Uh, last year was meant to be a, a good year of 3.5% growth. It became a very bad year of minus 3.5% growth. And that after unprecedented stimulus from governments around the world that added up to some 10 to 15% of GDP. So the economic blow was, was unprecedented. Um, 100 to 150 million people pushed back into poverty, according to the World Bank. And, and really what coronavirus also did was uh, uncovering fault lines across the world, but also in individual individual countries and many countries are still struggling with the aftermath of coronavirus. So uh, to give some perspective and to give hopefully a very positive perspective, we are delighted to have Professor Ian Golden to speak on the theme of the world after coronavirus and few people are better positioned than he. Um, it's interesting, his CV actually starts in 1996. That cuts off the time when I met him first at the OECD in Paris in 1988. Uh, we were a little bit younger at that, uh, at that point. But uh, Ian has gone on to do great things in his life since then. Uh, he is now the Professor of Globalization and Development at the University of Oxford. He is a professorial fellow at Balliol College, Oxford University and director of the Oxford Martin Program on Technolo Technological and Economic Change, and the director of the Future of Development. And from 2006 to 2016, he was the founding director of the Oxford Martin School. But he's far more than an academic. Uh, Ian is one of the great thinkers of the world. He is one of the great thinkers on development and the transformation and of what is possible. But he has also been a, a, a practitioner like me, he worked in the World Bank as a vice president of policy. He was the head of the, develop, the uh, Development um, Bank of Southern Africa. And at the same time, he was there uh, an advisor to President Nelson Mandela. Uh, I would almost say himself. It must have been a great pleasure to be an advisor to uh, such a great man at such an important time. That was the early 90s. Uh, he's very well, uh, Professor Golden is very well published. He's had, he writes faster books than I can speak. Uh, his lecture today is in part based on his latest book. And this is the last time that we mention it, but it is uh, Rescue from Global Crisis to a Better World. Uh, Professor Golden, over to you. Thanks very much, Bert. Uh, it's a huge pleasure to uh, be participating in the uh, EAI Distinguished Public Lecture uh, at NUS uh, and to be able to connect with so many friends and people I don't know uh, around the world through this digital uh, Zoom conference. What it really reflects, I believe, is one dimension of how globalization has really withstood the pressures uh, of all the talk about deglobalization and certainly the pandemic. Without this, we wouldn't have nearly the sense of solidarity we were having with each other, the information we have, and of course, the ability to deal with the pandemic. It's this digital connectivity, which is one of the many new accelerants of globalization. And as we accelerate this process, and we think about how globalization is likely to evolve, I'd like to share with you some thoughts on how the pandemic might have changed things, what might be happening in the coming years, and reflect, although I'm certainly no expert, on the implications, particularly for East Asia. For me, we are at a crossroads for humanity. 
And what we need to work through over the coming months and years is whether we really do wake up and learn from this pandemic, whether this is the pandemic to end pandemics. And by learning to cooperate, we're able to create a better world. Whether by learning to cooperate, we are better able to deal with climate change, with the other great crises that we face collectively, or whether this is going to lead to growing protectionism, nationalism, and a downward spiral, which inevitably would mean more pandemics, perhaps more severe than this one, growing inequality, lower global growth, and a less stable and unpredictable world. And although it might seem paradoxical, my view is that radical change undertaken over the coming months and years will be the way to create a far more predictable and stable world. In other words, by changing our ways of doing things, by learning from the pandemic, we can create a more inclusive, more sustainable globalization. The key question, of course, is how we exit the pandemic and how we get there. When I think about this time in history, I think very much about the comparison between the First and the Second World Wars. And as you know, the First World War was an absolutely ghastly war. It was one which H.G. Wells believed, the author, the war to end all wars. That was not to be. It was followed shortly by the Spanish flu, misnamed because in fact came from Texas, but the Spanish called it and got saddled with the name. And then the Roaring Twenties. The question now is, are we about to enter another Roaring Twenties a century later? And I believe we are. The pent up demand for spending, the savings that we've uh, accumulated, the stimulus packages, will lead to very rapid growth in the coming years. But if this focuses on consumption, as the Roaring Twenties of a century ago did, rather than investment in growth, it will be totally unsustainable. Indeed, it could lead, amongst other things, to a spike in greenhouse gas emissions. What we've known from previous fiscal stimuluses, such as after the 2007-8 financial crisis, is that when you spend money on cement, on steel, on infrastructure, you get a very big increase in carbon emissions and other greenhouse gases. And so the design of the stimulus really matters, how it's spent, whether this is about a Green New Deal. And of course, the other thing we learned from the 20s of a century ago, it was characterized by recrimination. Although the League of Nations aimed to stop wars, in fact, what happened is a blame game. The losing countries in the war, notably Germany, were made to pay reparations. They were made poorer. And within countries, inequality grew too. The unsustainable nature of the recovery led to the Great Depression, huge policy errors, the rise in inequality, and with that protectionism, nationalism, anger by the countries that felt that they were not respected any longer, and of course the rise of fascism and an even worse war. That is a cycle we need to learn from. And it was learned in the Second World War, because many of the leaders that were in power in the Second World War were scarred by the memory of the first. And so in the midst of that war, a new world order was created. Churchill, Roosevelt and others created the United Nations system. And with the support of great thinkers like Beveridge and Keynes, the, United, the Bretton Woods institutions, the welfare state, the Marshall Plan, 3% of US GDP was given in overseas aid in contrast to the First World War, where the debts had to be repaid. A massive debt write-off and many other dimensions. And what followed 
we know in history as the golden age of capitalism a period of unprecedented progress in France, the Trente Glorieuse, the 30 Glorious Years, from the mid-1940s to the mid-70s. A period when governments took the lead, a period when tax rates at the margin were extremely high, 70% in the US, through conservative and Democrat governments, Similar rates in the UK, both conservative and Democrat. And when I asked my friend Margaret Macmillan, the great historian of wars and many other things, was this just down to leaders? And do we have to rely on the fact that leaders emerge and if they don't, we damned by history? The answer is no. In fact, one of the most remarkable things that happened is that within six weeks of the end of the Second World War, Winston Churchill, who was the war hero, who had delivered the Allies from defeat in the eyes of many, was dumped by the electorate. A landslide victory for Clem Attlee, who was a virtual unknown. Why am I talking about this? The answer is that in the end, it was the mood of the world's population and particularly of Europeans and people in North America, that they did not want the cycle to continue of instability. That those that had sacrificed so much during the war needed to be paid back. That their lives were lost and the suffering was not in vain. And I believe we again at a period like that in human history. When you look at the public opinion polls around the world, and certainly this is true of all the East Asian countries as well, there's a hunger for change. 90% on average of citizens across the world believe that we should not go back to business as usual. It's business as usual which got us to where we are. It's the cause of the pandemic. It's the cause of rising inequality, of climate change, and the many other bad things that are in our lives and will get worse. And so what people around the world are saying is let's learn from this pandemic. Let's ensure that it does lead to a better world. And the question is, how do we do that? My own view is that there are multiple dimensions in which the pandemic is likely to change things, but most things are not gonna be very different. They've been accelerated. COVID-19 has been the great accelerator. It's compressed into the period of a year or two, developments that would have taken 10 or 20 years to emerge. There are very few things that would not have happened. They're just happening more quickly. And as things happen more quickly, we need to change our views and we need to learn more quickly. We need to evolve our ideas more quickly. This is across the board. Globalization has evolved more quickly. What we've seen is not only the acceleration of digital, but of course, the acceleration of the center of economic gravity of the world moving to East Asia, focused over China, but certainly including other countries. And that's because they've had a more rapid recovery. That's because they were better prepared and more effectively engaged with the fight against COVID-19. And so the economies have done better, whether it's in China, Taiwan, Singapore, Indonesia, right across, South Korea certainly too. And what we see with that is a growing share of global GDP and of course, growing trade, not only within the region, but between the region and other regions. When you look at the container rate traffic, prices across the Pacific routes or the Asia European routes, you see record container prices. And indeed, despite the attempts by President Trump to isolate the US, particularly from China, the contrary has happened. We see the big ports in, on the Pacific in the US having record levels of traffic, whether it's Long Beach, Los Angeles, San Diego, or others. There's never been a period 
of more intense trade. And we see this in private investment flows as well. Just yesterday, another new big deal was struck by another big US financial services firm for investments in China. So far from deglobalization, when we look at many of the trade dimensions and many of the financial dimensions, we see much higher levels. Of course, overall global trade decline, but mainly for re other reasons. Is this trend likely to continue? I believe it will. In fact, I think we are about to enter a period of record financial flows. There are many dimensions to this. One is mergers and acquisitions are likely to increase because there's been a repricing of asset values, not only within countries, between sectors, but also around the world, where the returns will come from in the future. And of course, there's gonna be a need for massive public investment flows, bailouts of countries. This has just started, much more needs to be done. While the rich countries have found 17 trillion dollars for themselves in fiscal stimulus to support their firms, their workers in the response to COVID-19. Less than 100 billion has been found for developing countries, far less than 1%, close to half a percent. This, in my view, is a great, great failure of global leadership, which was not reversed, unfortunately, at the G7 and needs to be at the next G20 meeting. This failure reflects not only a failure of leadership, but a failure to understand where the threats come from in the future. Unlike after the financial crisis, or during the financial crisis, when George W. Bush was able to step up to the plate, call the heads of state, including, of course, China, and great, create a global stimulus package, which offset the impact of the crisis to some extent, including for developing countries, there's been no such response now. Indeed, the rising tensions between the US and China are the greatest threat we face. Because no problem can be solved without a harmonious world, particularly between the superpowers, Europe, the US, China, and India, of course, very important too along with other big countries, whether it's pandemics, whether it's climate change, whether it's assistance for development. And the fact that development aid has gone down at a time of record need, as Bert mentioned, well over 100 million people being pushed into absolute poverty by the pandemic. Far more people are likely to die of starvation than die of COVID-19. The fact that we are reducing aid budgets at this time, not least in my country, the UK, is, I believe, a very negative feature. But other aspects of globalization have been rather robust, not only digital and financial, but the nature of the transformation. And why I believe that the pandemic has accelerated trends is because many of these things were happening before, including the supply chain and value chain transformation. There are four reasons why the supply chain is being transformed, of which only one can be somehow related to the pandemic. The first is technological change. Robotics, automation, artificial intelligence, machine learning are leading to a complete transformation of the way production systems work, whether it's in manufacturing or services or agriculture. And that transformation is leading to dramatic shifts in comparative advantage. These need to be deeply understood to understand the future of growth prospects for different regions. Anything that's repetitive and rules-based that doesn't require empathy or dexterity or creativity, intuition, is likely to be done by machines in the future. This means that everything from garments like the shirt I'm wearing to manufacturing processes in other areas, services like call centers on which 
and, and back offices on one which 1.6 million people in the Philippines rely on. All of that is likely to be automated and put into the cloud, digital services, or robotics and reshored over the coming 10 to 15 years. And many of these processes have been accelerated. Machines don't get sick, they don't ask for higher wages, and they never buy. And the price of capital is lower in the advanced economies and near the big markets than it is in developing countries. So the drive of globalization to low cost locations is no longer a factor in determining semi-skilled and unskilled production processes. The second big trend which has been accelerated is customization. The immediacy of product development for individuals. There's a mini factory that produces BMW minis up the road from me in Oxford, which is a robotic factory, employs less than 800 people on a shift. When I was a student, there were 22,000 people employed in that factory. There are over a million different varieties of mini BMWs that people can choose from. But that can only be done by an automated production line. Humans cannot create that capacity to interchange and differentiate at the speed and efficiency which is done by machines. So customization, whether it's in genetically differentiated drugs, which is of the future, or whether it's in t-shirts with our names on, require automated processes in scale. And the third reason is immediacy. What the pandemic has accelerated is our desire to have things delivered to our front door this afternoon or tomorrow at latest, but not in three weeks time coming in a container from the other side of the world. And that requires production nearer to home. And the fourth, of course, is the pandemic has accelerated concerns of a political nature, which are not financially sensible. And that is about trying to do things at home, protectionism and nationalism, which will accelerate the desire under the rubric of resilience, which I believe is a false rubric, to do things at home. Because in fact, what the pandemic has shown is that the globalization supply chains are remarkably resilient. We go to our supermarkets and still buy food from around the world at the height of the pandemic. And apart from some supply constraints, which would have occurred equally if production was at home in the production of masks or computers, and certainly now with computer chips, we've seen this remarkable resilience that comes from globalization. Yes, there are occasional blockages in the Suez Canal. The nodes and networks of globalization need to be managed more effectively and an undue reliance on certain nodes, like the Suez Canal, is vital to differentiate our supplies. But that doesn't require production at home. That requires a more sophisticated use of global supply chains. Globalization has been the most progressive force for development in the history of humanity, by which I mean flows across national borders, and certainly Singapore epitomizes this, is emblematic of this. At the same time, we need to recognize that globalization also could be its own undoing. Because globalization does not only spread goods, it also spreads bads, what I call the butterfly defect of globalization. We're in a complex dynamic system, which is very unstable. And as we've seen with the cascading risks that came through financial centers being connected, leading to the global financial crisis. As we see with cyber risk, that our cyber connectivity can lead to increasingly dangerous cyber attacks. As we've seen with the spread of bad ideas as well as good ideas during the pandemic. The good ideas spreading learning about wearing masks, about what to do, and of course the development of vaccines would never have been possible without globalization the globalization of science. At the same time, the spread of fake news, anti-vaccination movements, jihadism, and other dangerous ideas spreads through the internet. And of course, the pandemic itself. The super connectors 
in globalization are also the super spreaders, whether it's an airport hub, a cyber hub, a financial hub or other. And so how you manage this becomes absolutely critical. And it's not only that the super spreaders need to be managed and we need to work out ways to better do this. And I believe it's absolutely possible, whether it's in finance, cyber or pandemics, but also, of course, that good can lead to bad. It's great that 2 billion more people in the world have got electricity for the first time over the last 40 years. But that is leading to escalating climate change. It's wonderful that over a billion people now have access to antibiotics for the first time, hugely improving their life expectancy and health. At the same time, this is leading to rising antimicrobial resistance. And so how we manage the externalities, the spillovers of our success becomes increasingly critical as more and more people have access to the goods of globalization. The spillovers get greater and greater. The richer we get, the more connected we are, the more our individual lives and the choices we make impact on the rest of the world. And so taking responsibility at the individual level for our choices, at the national level, becomes more and more important and inevitably requires more coordination. There is no wall high enough that will keep out the threats that we face in the future, be they climate change, pandemics or others. But what high walls do for even the strongest countries like the US or China is keep out the opportunities to manage these threats. The people, the ideas, the technologies, and most of all, the will to cooperate. And so the greatest threat we face is too little globalization, not too much, particularly too little globalization in the realm of ideas and in politics. It's politics that needs to be more globalized and our ability to understand from the pandemic that we're all in this together. As Kishore Mahubani has so eloquently written, we like individual countries, cabins on an ocean liner together in a stormy sea, and we need to cooperate. We cannot forge an individual future without the world being a healthier place. And how we do this is gonna require the great powers and many others to come together. Now, not everything requires collective action. Climate change, a dozen countries account for 80% of emissions. Finance, a dozen countries are systemically important, the rest are not. Antimicrobial resistance, New York State consumes more antibiotics than the whole of Sub-Saharan Africa. 48 countries are less important in terms of micro antimicrobial resistance than New York is. Space debris, there are very few countries that have created and can solve that problem. But pandemics are different. And what pandemics teach us is our threats come from everywhere. The smallest, poorest country is a threat, as is the richest and the richest labs. And increasingly, it's the labs that we need to worry about. So everyone is in it together. And we recognize that for the first time in the history of humanity, we are facing a common threat. And by learning about that, we are learning about what we need to do. There are many dimensions of the pandemic which will also accelerate other dimensions of our life. For example, work. And there I've been thinking deeply and writing rescue about how it is likely to affect economies, productivity, our lives. Far from globalization in the pandemic being a great equalizer, it's led to very rapidly rising inequalities within countries and between them. Within countries, because some people can remote work remotely and others can't, because some people are much more vulnerable health-wise to the pandemic than others. And so mortality rates are hugely differentiated. In the UK, Black, Asian and minority ethnic groups are four times as likely to die from the pandemic than the rest of the population. Young people also are very differently affected to older people. And young people have made a sacrifice of their social lives, of their education, of their job prospects in many cases, and have inherited a mess of debt. 
So we need to think very differently about this. And I believe the future of cities can be at risk because if offices flee and the income base of cities is undermined and the public transport systems become increasingly indebted as they are because they don't get these big groups of people predictably coming through them, then the dynamics of the ecosystem of cities are threatened. And if that's combined with the curtailment of migration, it leads to a rapid degeneration of cities. And we're seeing that, and it threatens London, New York, and other great cities. These great cities like Singapore, like Mumbai, like Shanghai, and like so many others, are the hubs of the future. They are the hubs of innovation and creativity, not by accident, but by design, because they bring together diverse people with capital, sparking off each other, leading to new ideas. And so when I interviewed over 100 CEOs for my book and asked them how the pandemic was affecting them, even those that were very successful because they were in technology or in online retail distribution of food and other services, talked about the efficiency gains and law firms have made record profits, for example, working remotely. But when you ask the question, have you had any creative ideas? The answer is no. And how have you done with bringing young people in and grow? The answer is it's not easy. And that's because all jobs are apprenticeships or most jobs are. We learn not by reading a book or watching a video, but by watching people and engaging often informally. We engage and we challenge. And unless we're able to have those informal interactions, we are unlikely to be able to ask the difficult questions and pose the difficult questions, which challenge organizations and force them to continue to learn and thrive. And so as we think about the future, we need to think about a combination of virtual engagements and not forget the physical, particularly for young people. And we also need to ensure that we invest in those that cannot work remotely, either because they don't have the circumstances at home, they're sitting at the end of their beds with bad Wi-Fi, with children around, or elderly people to take care of, they don't have the privacy, don't have the ability to work remotely, or because they're simply in jobs which cannot be remote. And that's true of all essential workers who we clap for, but we haven't rewarded adequately. So we need to recalibrate. And we need to invest in the ways that we do things and particularly concerned about how we recalibrate and think about work and cities in ensuring that we have dy dynamic ecosystems. There are many other aspects of the pandemic which are significant. One of the things that's come up very clearly, of course, is as we accelerate the move to remote work, remote robotics and automation, we are also going to change the opportunities for professional services work. If we can work from home, well, why do we need to be in the same country? And so some places will benefit. Why should we pay a lawyer a thousand dollars an hour because they're sitting in New York or London or some other expensive place when we could get the same job done for $50 an hour from a remote location? The globalization of professional services is going to be greatly accelerated by the pandemic. And as that happens, new opportunities arise for skilled people around the world to do professional services in new ways. And I believe we will see an unbundling of many of these. And so this raises big questions about what is the future of work? And not only for skilled people about where they are, the spatial geography, but for semi-skilled and unskilled. What are the 100 million people who are coming onto the workforce over the next 10 years or so in Africa going to do? What jobs will they do? If the opportunities for repetitive rules-based jobs in manufacturing or in services, in call centers, in back offices are disappearing, are we gonna to have to revert in a development model to a more primitive model where you focus on tourism, on commodity exports, 
what are the middle runs of the development ladder in a world of accelerated artificial intelligence, robotics automation, and remote work? And these are deep questions which were being posed anyway, but now have been accelerated because what we thought would emerge over 10 years now is likely to emerge in the very, very short term in the coming years. For East Asia, there are many implications arising out of the pandemic. The one that was very clear very early on is there's been a tremendous learning. Because countries in the region have experienced pandemics many times and learned by them before, the wearing of masks, the bowing and not touching of hands, and other deep patterns of behavior have been embedded in populations, cultures, and ways of doing things. And of course, the ability to very quickly understand what is in the public interest. The difference between I and we, between me and us, is better understood in many Asian countries than it is in those where individualism has run rampant. And that's particularly true in Europe, especially in the UK and the US over the last 50 years or so, since the mid 70s. We've seen this swing in the individualism becoming dominant, which has led to much greater difficulty in accepting the restrictions that the pandemic has imposed upon us. And a reluctance of governments to do the right thing, which is to follow the World Health Organization's guidelines quickly, effectively. And so in the US and UK, it's no accident that we were laggards, that we have some of the highest mortality rates per capita. And I believe that's because of governments prioritizing individuals over society by being very reluctant to put any restrictions on social gatherings, on mobility. And that, of course, led to a very late response to the pandemic with tragic consequences for millions of people. That is embedded. So one big difference that we're seeing is the better ability to understand norms and behavior change. A second, of course, has been to benefit economically from this by having much higher rates of growth, much higher focus in R&D investment in many countries, and with that, a, a different balance as well between government and private sector, the role of governments in so many areas. As the center of economic gravity moves to East Asia, as the skill levels relative to other regions build, I believe we will reinforce this tendency. The question is the, kind of what the political response is gonna be and how the region cooperates, relations between Australia and China, for example, critical in this respect, as well as the interaction with the rest of the world. My hope, is that we can take from this pandemic an understanding of the urgent need to recalibrate relations, to think deeply about how globalization works, but also threatens us through the super spreading of dangers, how we manage these threats, not by retreating into a cocoon, that would be a tragedy. It would lead to slower growth and slower problem solving for all of us. It would lead to a more unstable world, a less predictable world, a much more dangerous place. We have to take from this pandemic the lessons of the Second World War, not the First World War. The ability to, in the midst of this pandemic, to recognize that bouncing back to business as usual keeps us on this path which is leading over a precipice keeps us doing the wrong things rather than bouncing back or even resetting, which implies that we go back to the operating system that's locked in to the system. When I reset my computer, I go back to the factory settings. We need to do things differently. Can we do them differently? I would argue what the pandemic has demonstrated is that we certainly can. We are doing things so differently today, it would be unimaginable 
in January 2020. If someone had told me that the government would tell me when I can hug my friends, when I can fly, what I must do, I would have thought that was impossible. I'd be living in North Korea. And yet, I embrace it today and accept it. If someone had said that a conservative government in the UK and in many other places would run a fiscal deficit of 10% or more of GDP, embrace record debts, pay workers not to go to work, support firms not to go bankrupt, I would have thought that would be impossible. Not even the most left-wing, left-wing governments in Europe would have dreamt of that. And yet, that is what conservative governments are doing today. We've seen changes in behavior of individuals and of societies and governments in ways which would have simply been imaginable. And so we know we can change. We know the old orthodoxy does not apply, that they are not critical debt thresholds. Of course, we need to worry about debt. But as long as it's invested in growth, it is sustainable. The lesson from the Roaring Twenties is not to invest in consumption, not to spend on consumption. We need to invest sensibly. And I believe that needs to be in a green growth. The other lesson, of course, is that the great powers need to cooperate. And we need to show solidarity. We need to be giving more to other countries and we need to focus on problem solving. The Bretton Woods Institution, that moment in history, initially was created for the reconstruction of Japan, of Germany, and the others who had suffered so terribly in the war, despite the fact that they'd been the enemy. That's the spirit we need to embrace. The spirit which understands that we can only be as good as others are. A spirit which understands that global growth requires global cooperation. A spirit which understands that out of these tragedies, good things can come. The opportunity is now. If we wait till after the pandemic, we'll be complacent. We'll be enjoying ourselves again. We'll be getting on with things. The sense of urgency will pass. The other lesson of the Second World War is that in the midst of the war, while the bombs were dropping, while Churchill and Roosevelt were fighting battles on five fronts, in the UK, there was a real danger of being invaded. Elderly people were being put to work to build blockhouses to stop a German invasion. At that time of peak crisis, of existential risk, the new world was created, the United Nations, the welfare state, the Bretton Woods institutions, a world of global solidarity. Our time to create a better world is now, not tomorrow. And my hope, and that's certainly the purpose of having written rescue, is that we can learn from this, and that through this crisis, we will create a more stable, a more predictable, and a more prosperous world. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Ian, for this uh, inspiring talk. And as I, I, I didn't promise, overpromise, you are the optimist. Uh, and it's wonderful to hear your ideas and, and, and the links that you make, the complexities that you see and work through um, in your speech and, and, of course, also in your writing. Uh, I forgot to tell in advance that uh, questions have to be, unfortunately, have to be put through the Q&A button. Uh, there's no way of managing more than 200 people online. Uh, I haven't figured it out, at least. Uh, so I'm, uh, I, 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 but I already see some questions coming in. But I take the prerogative of the of the chairman, and you called for difficult questions to be asked. So let me ask some difficult <laughs> questions. Uh, the one is, and it actually corresponds with a question of Andrew Collier. The one is, uh, you, your your view of the post-World War II might be a bit too rosy because it was also the start of the Cold War and uh, that big tensions between two blocks in the world. And some of that 
uh, seems to be appearing now, but particularly between China and the US. So the question is, how do we avoid the Cold War? Not that we want to avoid the Cold War, yes, we do, but how do we avoid the Cold War? And the second, and that is related, my second question is, and, and I did a little bit of writing, not as eloquently as you, uh, but looking historically, uh, yes, COVID was bad and it's still ongoing and there's many victims and lots of economic impact, but it's nowhere near a World War II. It's nowhere near World War I. It's nowhere near the Napoleonic War, which gave a big shift in international thinking or the 30 year war uh, that, that uh, led to the Westphalian, the Westphalian world order. So uh, uh, to be put it bluntly, is this big enough to shift people's minds and behavior not just nationally, but internationally, not just at a personal level, but at an international level. Difficult questions. Thanks, Bert, I can rely on you. And that's one of the reasons you're such a good friend is that you, you provide a wonderful challenge. Um, I think both are, are excellent questions. And um, the Cold War, yes, it began to develop pretty soon after the Second World War, but it was really only uh, in the early 60s that it, that it it really became existential with the Cuban Missile Crisis and then after that. Um, and, and it did uh, seriously risk many things uh, and divided the world. And indeed, uh, I argue elsewhere um, that the end of the Cold War uh, associated with the opening up of China, the Maastricht Treaty, uh, NAFTA, Uruguay round of trade negotiations, Create, really is what got globalization going. It wasn't until after uh, that, so we, end of the eight, 89, 90, when you, when you returned to Germany. Uh, the, the, that's, that's true. And the, 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 the globalization, that's before the other thing that happened in 1990, of course, the development of the World Wide Web, uh, which was also crucial for that as an impetus. That set of circumstances was there, but what we did get, despite the Cold War, was uh, not the return to the cycle, and Europe has not seen the return to the cycle of war. You know, so so yes, uh, it didn't. The Cold War slowed globalization, but it didn't slow two things: it didn't slow peace, uh, that that remained stable, and it didn't slow progress either. When you look at things like nutrition and life expectancy. You see huge progress in the 1950s and 60s. Educational levels grows more rapidly then than at any time uh, in Europe and North America. The, you know, the, the, partly because a free education system was created, a free national health system was created uh, across Europe uh, and the and the US. Um, access US remained a bitty. But there, there was such progress in infrastructure investment and so on that you did see amongst the, the non-Soviet countries this extraordinary uh, progress uh, in many, many, many uh, dimensions. And including, of course, in East Asia, in Singapore, um, you know, really began to progress during the Cold War. So the Cold War, yes, there was a Cold War. And I do worry very deeply about a new Cold War emerging. I think we were at grave risk for this, from this. And I, one thing I, I didn't like many things about the G7, but one thing I, I particularly didn't like is it had the feel at times of trying to create a new alliance against China. Uh, and that is very dangerous because we can't, you, you know, you can't at the one hand talk about resolving climate change and resolving pandemics which is what the G7 talked about. And at the same time say, we're gonna do it without China. These are two contradictory things uh, that one cannot have a healthy world uh, and stable world without learning. Now, I believe that one should learn, uh, and Kissing just certainly got this, uh, one should learn that one can disagree and uh, agree at the same time. One can disagree on some fundamental issues, be they human rights or others, and one can agree to work together on shared global growth, on our mutuality of interest and idea that, that the success of the democracies is somehow gonna be at the expense of the autocracies is the failure to understand how global growth works 
our global problem solving works. Uh, and, and, and I think that is a very worrying tend. So I think you're right to raise the Cold War threat. It is, I think, the biggest threat that we face in terms of all the things I've talked about. Uh, your point about is COVID a big enough threat um, is an interesting one. And what, what, what we ideally want in the world is a small threat to turn into a very good, big solution. What we saw in the financial crisis, in my view, was a, the biggest financial crisis we've known uh, since the global, since the Great Depression, uh, turning to a very poor response. I'm very worried that not enough has been done to deal with the, the, the systemic risks in finance, for example. Not least that, that we've seen with the pandemic is a complete failure to understand concentration risk. Uh, we, we, I thought Hurricane Sandy would wake, uh, or 9-11 would wake Wall Street up, but it hasn't. And there's even more concentration risk uh, in Wall Street uh, than there was and the pandemic. Now, the pandemic, although it's not as big as the wars in some respects, in other respects is bigger. I mean, it's much more global than any war has ever been. Uh, the Spanish flu was global. It perhaps killed a third of the world's population, but it was very slow. Uh, you know, it took three or four years to reach the rest of the world because it was by shipping uh, and, and there was no information. We still don't know, haven't got a clue how many people died from the Spanish uh, flu. This pandemic is live on TV uh, or in our digital flows all the time. We know we, there's a lot of uncertainty, like how many people are dying in India. We have no idea or Africa, but, uh, but we know a huge amount more. So I think we're more conscious of it and I think it's more global than anything that the world has ever experienced, even if the death numbers, fortunately, are, are lower. It's also had a bigger economic impact. Huh? You talk about uh, the World Bank numbers on poverty. Nothing has ever derailed development in a way that the pandemic has. This is much bigger than the wars in derailing development. Uh, and we're we still beginning. You know, The SDGs have been completely derailed by the pandemic. Uh, IMF's done some good work on this, maybe 10 years derailment at least. So I don't think in terms of, I, I think in some respects, it's actually bigger than the wars, not in mortality, but if you add the number of people that might die of starvation, maybe it will be bigger in terms of mortality uh, as a result. So um, let's hope. The answer is there's no direct relationship between the size of the crisis and the resolution. It depends on our actions in turning an understanding of the risk into a resolution. Um, we, it seems like humans can be thrown off a cliff and hit the ground a few times before they wake up. Uh, and we need to make sure that when we see the cliff and get pushed towards the edge, we turn away. Thanks, thanks. And you do remind me that from now on, I will call the Spanish flu, the Texan flu. Yes. Uh, you already mentioned one of the big thinkers here in Singapore, Kishore Mabubani. He has a straightforward question, but a very important question. Uh, why did India handle the pandemic so badly? And what do you think are the international consequences of, of that failure to handle the pandemic from, from an Indian perspective? It's very important for the region. Uh, how does that play out internationally in politics? Yeah. Um, great that you're participating, Kishore. I um, uh, hope you're well, and I've learned so much from, from your work. Uh, <laughs> I think the, there's a real correlation between populist leaders uh, around the world and their failures to manage the, the pandemic. We saw this with Trump and we saw the dramatic shift uh, when uh, Biden came into power and the shift in, in how the US is handling the pandemic. We've seen that in the UK, uh, really terrible handling of the pandemic, much better handling of the vaccines, uh, but uh, you know we have one of the highest mortality rates in the UK. Uh, we've seen it in Brazil uh, dramatically. We've seen it in Turkey dramatically. Uh, and um, we were seeing it early on in Russia. And I think we're seeing it in India. So the first is uh, these populist leaders, and I would certainly class Modi as that, uh, who rely on more on the sound of their own ideology and voice than on science, uh, evidence, and international opinion, anti-internationalist uh, as well anti-expert uh, in, in their stances. I think that's, that's a, a primary reason. A secondary reason, which also relates to some of the reasons why the US, Brazil, 
and um, other and India have handled badly is that the public health infrastructure is extremely poor and uneven. And over 60% of, of Indians are employed in the informal sector and very high share, by the way, of Brazilians also are. And these people have no health coverage, basically, uh, to speak of. Uh, so extreme inequality, you know, uh, with very poor health coverage leads to very poor infrastructure. And we've seen the desperate need of people to get access to oxygen, to PPE equipment, et cetera, uh, playing out in, in terribly sad ways uh, in India. But we've seen the same in, in the Amazonian areas of, of Brazil uh, and, um, and elsewhere. So uh, I think it's, it's that. The lesson, in my view, is that those countries that listen to the World Health Organization advice quickly, that had good public health systems in place, uh, were able to deal with it more effectively. Um, and um, there was also some dramatic policy mistakes in India, forcing people to go into the countryside, super spreading the pandemic and not giving those that remained a place to stay and things, huge, huge problems in, in that. But in the end, it comes down to, I think, the capability of leaders. And one of the interesting political questions, if that is right, is, is there going to be a pushback? We've already seen it in um, the US uh, with a pushback against uh, Trump. Uh, I think we're seeing it in some other European countries, uh, a swing. And I think we could well see it in India as well. And we did see it in recent election results already, uh, that uh, I think we recognize that populist leaders can be dangerous. You already mentioned the issue of leadership and international coordination. And uh, there's two questions that relate to that. Actually, I, I, I link on a third one as well. Uh, from Gerard Lee, um, he said basically, says, so if, if, we, if we're gonna draw the right lessons, this international coordination is important. You already mentioned your disappointment about the G7, but the G20 is also not doing so well at the moment, unlike, unlike in the global financial crisis, frankly, they, were, they came together. So, so where is leadership going to come from? And related, yeah. re related to that, two, two questions, one from Hans Friens. Uh, so so how, uh, how are we going to change these international institutions if there is insufficient leadership or if there's divided leadership and how is that going to come about? And finally, from Andrew Kinlock, uh, I interpreted this being a question related to leadership. What's the future role of China in this? Yeah, these are <laughs> these are all difficult questions, um, and and clearly uh, the G20 is key, and it's been extremely disappointing. Um, the why? Uh, it's partly that the G20 can't be effective if the G7 isn't effective, because the G20 is in a sense the G7 plus. Um, so if the G7 can't get its act together, the G20 never can get its act together. Uh, and, um, and we're seeing that uh, dramatically. Uh, the G7 meeting was extraordinarily uh, strong on statements and extraordinarily poor uh, on action, on delivery. <laughs> you know, and there's the sound of, of Boris Johnson saying that we must give much more aid to developing countries right after he'd cut his budget for aid by a third is the sort of, to me, is emblematic of the problem of the G7. It's it's sort of a, it seems like it's designed for the media or something, but not for not for serious things. Now, there are positive signs. And I, I'm, for example, am very encouraged by um, a number of things. One is uh, this, the tax agreement, uh, which is too little, it's much too late. It's, you know, it's, it's been talked about in OECD, BEPS, and elsewhere for decades. But it, I think, it's happening because of a groundswell of discontent about tax arbitrage, uh, offshoring by individuals and by companies. Now, the fact that it's so low and that it only includes a, a handful of companies, uh, so it it'll only captures a very, very small share of the problem, is is the, the glass half empty, but it's at least it's on the table. Uh, and I think there's progress in that. The vac similarly on vaccines, 
another crucial area. I think we're beginning to see progress. Much more needs to be done, not least on intellectual property, manufacturing capacity, etc., uh, to roll it out. Uh, but we're beginning to see a recognition that at least they have to talk about it and think about it. And I think there's some good things happened on the way to COP26 on climate. Uh, so there, there's some good signs. Why is the G20 uh, so ineffective? Well, they're countries who have vastly different interests. You know, Saudi Arabia's interests on climate change are not the same uh, as many other countries. Um, and I think that coalition uh, is dangerous. I, I think we should be thinking about uh, not only making the G20 more effective if we can, but new coalitions. Uh, and part of the problem with this G structure is I think it's very trapped in the past. Uh, we had the G1, then we had the G3, then we had the G7, G20, G77, how many Gs? Uh, there's lots of them, uh, but none of them have lived up to purpose for a very long time. Why do we need, what, what the G structure is doing is firstly disempowering other levels of government, uh, subnational cities, etc. Secondly, it's not embracing the fact that of companies playing a leading role. And although there is a B structure now, like I, I participated in a B20 meeting yesterday that Italy convened, um, that that is a, a somewhat uh, selective and strange and not very powerful. Uh, I, my view is we should look at the problems and then find the solutions. So if the problem is climate change, let's focus on the 20 biggest emitting countries and the, 20, and the 100 biggest emitting companies. And let's not worry too much about the rest. The problem is, of that is legitimacy. You don't want the mafia bosses in the room designing a, a legal code. Um, but that could be assured by having you know, small countries like uh, the Seychelles will be underwater uh, because of climate change, or a country like Bangladesh, which will be, you know, significantly impacted uh, as part of it. So representative, are we prepared to give up some sovereignty to representative uh, constituencies? And are we prepared to say that the key actors, the Pareto principle, that 20% of the actors who make 80% of the difference should start? And often it's not governments, or not certainly not all governments, what the G20 isn't is representative of the problems. It's it's sort of an ad hoc group, uh, which does account for something like 80% of global GDP and population. But when it comes to problem solving is not the ideal constituency. Antimicrobial resistance would have a completely different constituency of actors. It would have pharmaceutical companies. Uh, it would have um, a few big countries, certainly China, India, the US and Europe have to be there. But the UK doesn't really have to be there because in terms of global antimicrobial production or uh, consumption, it's really not that important. Uh, you know, the G7 really is an action. When I looked at this G7, th these G7 leaders standing up saying, we're world leaders, really? Um, you know, uh, Canada's a world leader, Italy a world leader, um, yeah, Japan certainly. UK, uh, in terms of population or GDP, world leader in what respect? Uh, so we need, I think, to focus both on the key actors, and I would say basically China, India, Europe, US. If those four groups cannot agree things, we don't have much agreement. But certainly the China, US and Europe, I'd say three key players. Uh, on any problem. It's very difficult to think of a problem that doesn't require the three of them to agree on. Um, and then you add on other important players uh, and you add companies and cities, and you, or, or states. You know, the interesting thing when Trump pulled out of the Paris Agreement, uh, California, Illinois, New York State, and a group of companies that account for over 80% of carbon emissions in the US said we committed to remaining in it. And that is very, very important because they can still do the actions that a federal government uh, could do. Of course, they can't do federal regulation, but they can do it otherwise. And, and I think we need to take responsibility ourselves for problems. One of the, the things about uh, the knee-jerk reaction is let's throw this up to global governance 
is that we know global governance doesn't work. And so we're basically giving up on problem solving. If we take responsibility as cities, as companies uh, to, to being more active, I believe applying the subsidiarity rule as well as the Pareto principles, subsidiarity rules that we should resolve locally, whatever we can resolve locally. And the Pareto principle is let's get as, as, the smallest possible group of actors in the room that can make the biggest possible difference and build widening circles of cohesion and not assume those actors are governments only, uh, I believe we'll begin to problem solve. So that's the way I would go about trying to fix this problem. Uh, let, let's not use excuses that the system's broken, but actually be part of the solution. So that's the vision. And aside from inspiring academics such as Ian Golden, where does the leadership then come from? <clears throat> and that's the question of Brenda Yao, who is also a board member of the East Asian Institute and professor at NUS. Uh, is it going to be the UN? Is it going to be visionary leaders? What, 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 what brings the dynamics there? Or do you already see it and you have good examples? And then related but far more specific, and that relates to China, Hassan Jeffrey asks, so if you were to advise Xi Jinping today, how would you position China in this? And what, how should China position itself internationally to take on much more of a leadership role? Yeah. Um, great questions coming. Uh, who are the leaders? You know, the leaders are, are very different. Greta Thunberg's a leader. She thought she was a schoolgirl standing outside her school. Now she's created a global movement. Um, the, the person whose name I can't remember, who started the Me Too movement through, through a single tweet, is a leader. The, the protesters who started the Black Lives Matter uh, movement, which has gone global, are leaders. And the small individuals who never thought they were leaders have suddenly become leaders uh, because they're changing the way people think. They're changing attitudes. They're changing norms and behaviors. The companies that are, that are doing dramatically different things, the company leaders who are really doing it, not greenwashing, are leaders. Uh, people are, are changing and things are changing in dramatic ways. The people up the road from me who developed the new vaccines in Oxford and said, we insist that the intellectual property is open. They lead us by changing IP rules around that. Um, and, and of course, getting the vaccines out quickly. Uh, leaders are, are in multiple spheres. If the question is who the, who the global political leaders are, I would say Biden has proved remarkably robust in a very short period of time in many areas, certainly in the US. You know, he's doing things that Obama, um, Clinton could never have done, uh, let alone the Republican leaders in terms of fiscal stimulus in many other areas, resetting the, the, the dimensions. He's, I think, captured uh, by um, the past in terms of relations with China. And it's very interesting to see how the White House still seems to be captured uh, in, in the past uh, on China. Um, in Europe, uh, I think we, we are seeing leadership from the Commission in ways that wasn't possible before, including its capacity to raise debt for itself, which just wasn't possible before the pandemic. Another indication of how the pandemic really has changed things in ways that would have been unimaginable in January 2020. Uh, by the way, the Biden, what Biden's doing would have been unimaginable in, 20, in January 2020. Um, and, I, I, and we've got a few leaders in Europe. But Europe is, is divided and not powerful enough as individual countries, be it France or Italy or the UK, which is unfortunately not longer part of Europe, uh, to, to really make a difference globally. But Europe as a group certainly can, and I think we're beginning to see that. Um, there are not many other leaders of, of uh, huge global stature, and maybe that's a good thing, uh, because we shouldn't rely on the great leader theory of history. We should rely on countries just working together solidly to come together, uh, swayed by opinion. And we're seeing that, as I mentioned in my talk, in the way that public opinion has, has shifted. Um, there's also, I wouldn't underplay the importance of, of uh, intellectuals. You know, the, the great changes in the Second World War were not inspired by the leaders. They were inspired by Keynes, a uh, professor, uh, and by Beveridge, another professor. So <laughs> I'm not ruling, ruling out uh, professors yet. Um, 
the but it's the ability to connect with the politicians who think oh well that's a good thing that might make me look good if i if i embrace this as well and do it um what should uh, president uh, uh, xi jinping do uh is is a good question now i've been going to china uh every year except since the pandemic since 1984 uh and many many interactions with many many levels of leadership and and others in in china over that time and whenever i used to say to to my friends in china china needs to get much more active globally uh you know really uh china's playing far too low, small role the my friends in china always used to respond by saying ian you don't understand two things one is we have a lot of problems to solve domestically but we're still a very poor country. There's lots we have to focus on here. And secondly, the world doesn't want us to solve, uh, to be involved. The world is very scared of communism uh, and uh, of the Chinese role. Now, it's, you know, I, I was very struck by, by President Xi Jinping's talk at Davos in, I think it was um, January 2018. Uh, we saw what he's saying, but it was like, it's like the day that that uh, Trump got inaugurated. So, which year was it? 17. 17th. Yeah, I was there in in the hall, <laughs> and it was it was exactly it was when Trump was there, and you had this sort of total change. Suddenly, China was the advocate of globalization, of a more open, connected world, of global problem solving, of we all in it together, and the U.S was swinging in exactly the opposite direction. And it was like night and day. And I thought, fantastic. China has finally accepted global leadership, that it recognizes that um, it can only be as strong as the world, that it, that its threats will come from outside it, as well as uh, uh, the dynamics of what it does internally. And I thought that this was a corner that had been turned. I wasn't, of course, happy with the US withdrawing, I thought the two, China and the US had to work together. But I felt that China had made a difference. But since then, the world has not embraced it. And my friends in China that say that, they, that the world is scared of us have pro been proved right in many respects. Now, this isn't because of the experience. And that's what I find um, that we need to, to get, grapple with. You know, China's growth and success has been so good for the world in every respect. It's, it was the engine that pulled the world out of the global financial crisis. It's the reason why global growth has been robust. It's the reason why we've got PPE equipment and computers in response to the pandemic. Uh, there are so many positives from Chinese growth, including Chinese investment. But this fear of a different model uh, has been proved, I think, uh, a powerful political tool, particularly for populists in the US. And my understanding, uh, and it's really about the US politics in the end, and there have been some good articles about this, is that the great problem in the US is not autocrats in the world, but autocrats within the US. Uh, those that, the, the, the real challenge for, I think, a leader that wants to embrace uh, China is the populist use of the red threat uh, still is very, very powerful in, in the US. And the arguments need to be made in the US that actually China is good for the world, that working with China is necessary for the US's future, and that then there's no safe future for the world, not because of a war threat, but because of um, pandemics, global growth, instability without working with China. At the same time, China has a role to, and I don't think China's always plays its cards as well as it could. I think rising tensions in the South China Sea are a very negative feature. Uh, I think that what China's done in Hong Kong is a very negative feature. I think it needs to be much more open and transparent about what's going on internally in terms of human rights, uh, treatment of the Uyghurs and elsewhere. These are things people care about around the world. Uh, and China shouldn't live up to negative expectations by engaging in uh, escalations and in activities which reinforce and give ammunition 
to the fears of those that want to make China uh, into a, a threat. It should rather be showing in a hand which demonstrates that those threats are not uh, based on the way that China wants to behave with regard to the world. I don't see any need in, to change the fundamental model of China. It's been successful for the Chinese and can continue to be successful for the Chinese. But what it no, does need to appreciate is that actions have consequences in terms of perceptions around the world. And so de-escalating those actions, uh, I believe will be a very good first steps towards allowing a new sort of Kissinger moments, a new detente uh, to occur. And that's absolutely essential. Everyone in the world has an interest in that happening. And it's gonna take two side, both sides to make the actions to show we share a commitment to global growth, we share a commitment that of mutuality. We are not mercantilist. We are not believing that our wins are your losses. We have a shared interest in global prosperity, in resolving the challenges of climate change, of other challenges, and we'll do it together. Uh, and that requires us both to de-escalate some of the things which uh, we both see as leading to tensions. Thanks. Um... Uh, I'll, I'll convey it to Xi Jinping. Yes. <laughs> Please do, Bert. Yeah. And, uh, and, without, and, and ensure that I'm still allowed as a friend back into China because I am a friend of China. <laughs> the, um, a somewhat related question comes from Lukas Schuknecht. It's again on, a little bit on leadership, but more on international order. Um, Lukas Schuknecht is visiting professor here at the Lee Kuan Yew School, but also the former deputy Secretary of the OECD and the Chief Economist of the Ministry of Finance in Germany. Um, he asked, look, the, the post-World War II order was mainly a rule-based order. And, and you seem to be talking about something different, more proactive, more uh, fluid uh, coalitions of the willing that do things, and uh, so less rule-based. But, but shouldn't we just fix the rule-based system and, and make it make it fit for purpose for today or or is that or is should we give up hope on that i do believe in a in a much more um variable geometry uh, system where lots of different actors not only governments make rules uh local authorities cities um uh companies uh, shareholders uh etc make rules. So I think, I think you know, the, the post-war era was when governments basically were the, were the story. Uh, companies were not nearly as powerful. Newspapers were very powerful, but basically it was a few generally uh, elderly men smoking cigars in a room that decided the fate of societies and what people would understand and hear through the media. That is all changed. We have open information flows in ways that were unimaginable. Much companies which are much bigger than countries. Uh, and um, I think that requires a different way of acting uh, and obviously all sorts of new uh, country dimensions. So I think it's very different, but to the Westphalian system, but I also do believe in rules. You know, I think, uh, in fact, I believe in more rules in many areas. For example, I think we should introduce rules on carbon border adjustments in trade. Um, I think we should have rules and more rules and regulations on tax evasion. Uh, I think we, I think globalization requires the setting of standards uh, in some areas, in, including those where it can, it can be massive arbitrage like tax. Uh, I don't believe, I think we should have a global ban on child labor, for example, or slave labor. There are many areas where I think we need more rules, um, but those rules can be established through norms and developments, which where key actors come in and widening circles of cohesion. So yes, I, uh, <laughs> the idea of coalitions of the willing has got a bad name from Iraq, um, but I do think that coalitions of the working or coalitions uh, of groups of countries that are prepared to do things and move uh, is required. Uh, but it re is required on the basis of legitimacy. And that's the big lesson from Iraq. Uh, you know, one has to do it because the citizens know about it in a transparent way, uh, not because some leaders create some fake news and do something uh, 
uh, for reasons which uh, which are are not genuine. And I think there are many, many areas where that can be done. So I, I do believe in rules. I believe in regulations and more. Uh, and we need to learn from those that work. You know, there's, there's some rules and regulations which we love, like air traffic control that ensures that our planes don't crash. Um, global, huge changes in technology and in, in countries, and that works perfectly. Or the global postal union, for that matter, works perfectly. Uh, but... Um, the reasons they work is because people want them to work. Uh, that no one has an interest in pulling out of them. And that's where you begin uh, to develop it. Amongst those that make the biggest difference. And that's not, if, if some don't want to participate, let's just get on with it. And they'll come to the table. Let's also think of other ways of making them participate. Not through sitting at a meeting with them, but let's say for boycott their products. Uh, or put a carbon border adjustment on their carbon if they don't want to go to clean carbon. Uh, and this is happening. It's even happening in countries like Japan. Like Apple is saying to Japan, we're not going to manufacture our products there anymore if they won't move faster to renewable energy. And that's the role that companies can play. And that's what happens in a new world where different actors <laughs> set rules. The right rules. The right rules, and, and the right rules, of course. Like mini lateralism as a term, rather than a coalition of yes. the willing. But yeah, I um, like mini lateralism. Also, mini lateralism implies governments only, and correct. and my and my and and I remember very much. For I that. Very you know, like the example of Apple, companies can play a role too. A very big role indeed. Um, we're running out of time. We still have lots of questions, but I, I probably only have time for one or two. One comes from Eileen Wong, and it's switching gears a little bit. This is moving towards resilience and the new demands for resilience. Um, and, and in some people's views, the globalization has gone too far. You already mentioned the downsides of deglobalizing. But how is this increased demand for resilience going to work out? And will that lead potentially to uncertainties and protectionism and and therefore, in the end, inefficiencies, or how do you see that play out? Yeah, you know, the, the word resilience has suddenly popped to the top and, and efficiency has gone down in people's lexicons and, and Google searches and so on. Um, but no one really knows what we mean by resilience. Uh, resilience, uh, and, and, and I talk about this in, in some depth in the chapter on, on risk in, in rescue, resilience against what for what? We can't be resilient against everything. Uh, so what are we preparing resilience for? How much, uh, and resilience costs money, we're setting aside resources for it. Uh, how much are we setting aside? Uh, for what resilience? And my view is we need to calibrate according to the risk. You know, one of the things that, that just is, is extremely puzzling, but which needs to change, is that we spend thousands of times more on military preparedness in most countries, maybe not pan, uh, Singapore, than we do on... Um, pandemic preparedness. Why are we in the UK, you know, increasing our military budget by four billion pounds uh, and we don't allocate to pandemic preparedness what we'd allocate to, to one submarine? Uh, yet we know it's got a thousand times more risk of killing us. Uh, so the, the sort of, let's think about what the issues are that are threats and build resilience against them. Uh, and supply chains are not the threat. Uh, which is what companies seem to be focusing on. Actually, what we've seen is extraordinary resilience from multiple. But let's not rely on if we can. I mean, it's different with computer chips where there's a monopoly or oligopoly, uh, rather. Uh, let's let's try and diversify our sources. And I think spatial geo spatial diversification is the critical factor, as well as corporate and company diversification of supply chains. And that doesn't mean local. In fact, coming local could make you much less resilient because if something happens in your country, then you really don't have any supplies. Uh, those countries that rely on, like Singapore, multiple suppliers are most resilient. So the, the sort of relationship between resilience and protectionism and nationalism is an extremely intellectually lazy one, I think. Uh, and uh, not least in the context of some of a big area with many suppliers like Europe. You know, I've, I've got data again, it's in the book that shows that 99% of European supplies come from within Europe for the pandemic. Uh, so we, we need to, to think about resilience. And in the end, the real resilience is in our, our heads. How are we able to bounce back and what do we learn from it? And governments, you know, the, the fact that, that, the, that governments are more and more short-term 
and other and companies are more and more short term is the biggest negative on resilience because they are thinking about pushing problems away that won't happen on my watch i'll get my ceo benefit while well, win my election and someone else can worry about this problem like a pandemic or climate change that's the greatest danger for resilience so we need to think about resilience also in terms of time scales are we being resilient are we building resilience for our children is the question we should be asking ourselves well this has been a delight thank you so much ian for joining us and for for such a tour de force not just your presentation but a very engaging debate and and great questions from our participants and I, unfortunately i'm leaving seven questions unanswered some some really good ones uh, I'm, I'm not going to ask them but i just want to mention one will COVID 19 lead to the death of neoliberalism that would have been my next question but i'm not going to answer it because i'm not going to ask it because we are at at, at the limit of time but it the is the answer is yes <laughs> I, I actually thought it was already dead, but that's uh, that maybe, maybe I maybe I missed the headline because it is an interesting question. I think I think there has been an intellectual shift uh, because of COVID, and and indeed uh, whether that is modern monetary theory, which I still don't quite understand, but new ideas that get a lot more space because there is this this at least this feeling among academics, but also among people, maybe less among politicians, but things need to be different. And I think you're spot on with that. You're spot on with your speech and with your book, Rescue. I will, this is the second time I mention it. Um, and it was an inspiring afternoon for, for me, a morning for you. And I thank you deeply. And I hope that, uh, that uh, we'll have time to, at some point, uh, uh, do discussions like this live again in a room and after with a good meal in in uh, in uh, ahead of us thank you then then it'll have to be in singapore not the uk rather <laughs> much better food <laughs> thanks so much bert it's been a huge pleasure thanks to all the participants i hope you stay healthy uh, and i hope indeed that this pandemic does lead uh, to a better world but thanks for hosting me Bert, very much thanks everybody thanks for coming okay bye bye Great. bye